14-year-old groupies, predatory managers, theft of a rock star corpse, the music industry of the 1970s was not for the faint of heart. In the fall of 1970, Janis Joplin was working on what would become her best-selling LP, Pearl. Four years before, she had come to San Francisco and quickly evolved from a drifter into a prolific singer, too loud or brave to stay with her first band, Big Brother and the Holding Company. On October 4th, road manager John Cook went to check on Joplin after she failed to turn up to a meeting. Cook found her dead as a result of a heroin overdose. Less than a month before, Jimi Hendrix had also died of a drug overdose. The 1970s continued to be riddled with overdose deaths in the music world. On July 3rd, 1971, The Doors frontman Jim Morrison died in the bathtub of his Paris apartment, allegedly from heart failure, although many believe he accidentally overdosed on heroin. In 1977, Elvis Presley was found dead in his bathroom as well. An autopsy revealed that he had 14 drugs in his system at the time of his death. The Sex Pistols put the sex in sex, drugs, and rock and roll, but their frontman Sid Vicious did much darker things too. Vicious's mother was a heroin addict and supplied him with the drug as well. Like they were partners in whatever crime, the hell they were creating, whatever it was. In 1977, as he was climbing the ranks of the music world, Vicious began a relationship with a groupie, Nancy Spungen. I wanted to see something exciting. Their relationship was tumultuous to say the least. They would burn each other's arms with cigarettes, drink and do drugs, and fight, often physically. It all culminated on October 12, 1978, when Spungen was found dead in the Chelsea Hotel with a stab wound to the stomach. When the police arrested Vicious on suspicion of murder, he said, I did it because I'm a dirty dog. He then retracted his statement and went with another story. He claimed to have taken 30 Tuanol tablets, so he was fast asleep when Spungen died. Where would you like to be? Under the ground. Vicious never recovered from Spungen's death. Spungen's mother remembers Vicious saying he'd lost the will to live. And on one occasion, he tried taking his own life by cutting his wrists. On February 2nd, 1979, Vicious died of a heroin overdose. He was 21. Although the truth of Spungen's death will never be known for certain, the famous couple's story is a dark lesson. When Cher met fellow musician Sonny Bono in 1963, she was 16 years old and he was 28. Cher's mother told Ladies Home Journal that Bono was a father figure before he was a lover to Cher. He seemed really to know so much about life that I just didn't know. But the two became a star couple following their 1965 hit single, I Got You Babe. By 1971, two years after getting married, they had their own variety show, The Sonny and Cher Comedy Hour. It was a hit, which the couple needed badly. By now, they had a child and money was tight after the failure of a movie project. But the show was selling a lie. In 2010, Cher told Vanity Fair that Bono was not a very good partner. She confessed, I wouldn't have left him if he hadn't had such a tight grip. Such a tight grip. She is being tart. She's being tart right now. I'm not tart. You are tart right now. But Bono had double standards. He often cheated on his wife, and by 1973, he was living with another partner. Still, he and Cher endured a few more years of their toxic marriage for the sake of their show. They got divorced in 1975, and as expected, interest in their show quickly plummeted. Nowadays, Queen is known as one of the most prolific rock bands in history. But in 1975, despite having produced hits from the very beginning, they were broke. Drummer Roger Taylor commented to Far Out Magazine that they could barely afford to buy new drumsticks. You see management running around in stretch limos and think, hang on, there's something not right here. Indeed, something wasn't right. Trident studio owner Norman Sheffield, who was Queen's manager at the time, was making a lot of money off Queen's tracks and finding ever more creative ways to get out of paying the band. When the reality of Sheffield's fraud dawned on Freddie Mercury, Queen left Trident Studios. Frustrated and bitter, Mercury wrote an exceptional song for the A Night at the Opera album called Death on Two Legs. Its lyrics are pretty obvious. You've taken all my money and you want more, misguided old mule with your pig-headed rules. However, listeners didn't know who the song was about until Sheffield himself came out of the shadows 
and sued the band for defamation. A settlement was reached outside the court, but as a result of the lawsuit, Sheffield became the architect of his own demise. Everyone now knew him for what he was. If there's a contest for the worst band manager ever, Stan Pauly probably tops Norman Sheffield. In the mid to late 1960s, Badfinger, then as the Ivies, became the first band to be signed by Apple Studios after the Beatles. When you become known as an associate of the Beatles, you're standing under a large shadow. Paul McCartney particularly appreciated their style and took the band under his wing, to the extent that Badfinger became known as the new Fab Four. McCartney wrote Badfinger's Come and Get It. The song would reach number four in the United Kingdom after its release in 1970. But the United States was more enthusiastic about the band. Excited about their popularity in the US, Badfinger entrusted their finances to manager Stan Pauly. Pauly wasn't just greedy. He took away all the band's money and left behind a contract that made it impossible for them to make any more money without him. Tom Evans wrote the songs Hey Mr. Manager and Rock and Roll Contract to channel his frustrations. But on the morning of April 24, 1975, frontman Pete Ham died by suicide. He had a pregnant wife and a new house that he couldn't afford. In his suicide note, he called out Polly's wrongdoing. Indeed, after Ham's death, Polly tried to cash in Ham's life insurance. Eight years later, Tom Evans also died by suicide after repeatedly saying he too wanted out. On September 18, 1970, Jimi Hendrix joined the 27 Club, the infamous list of musicians who died at the age of 27. The official story seemed quite clear. His girlfriend, Monica Danneman, had found him unresponsive in the morning after a night of overindulging in illegal substances. But the truth behind Hendrix's death is far murkier. In 1973, Hendrix's former manager, Mike Jeffrey, was chatting to Rhodey James Tappy Wright when he made a very disturbing confession, Wright remembered. As we were talking, Mike began to get very agitated and pale. I had no bloody choice, I had to do it. You know exactly what I'm talking about. It was either that or I'd be broke or dead. Jeffrey then went on to say something along the lines of getting some nasty friends to pour, quote, booze down the windpipe. In an even creepier twist, Jeffrey was found dead a month after his confession. It turns out Jeffrey had ties to the mafia, to whom he owed money. Although his confession was never investigated or officially connected to Hendrix's death, it definitely adds another tragic layer to the rock star story. Singer-songwriter Graham Parsons died from a heroin overdose in September 1973, but the rock and roll life continued to haunt Parsons after his death in a very strange way. On September 20th, two drunk men wearing cowboy hats stole Parsons' corpse and drove it to Joshua Tree, California. These were Phil Kaufman, Parsons' manager, and an unnamed friend. As Kaufman confessed to Louder, he was en route to Continental Airlines at LAX, from where he would be shipped back to his stepfather in New Orleans. But Kaufman was adamant Parsons would not have wanted to be buried in Louisiana. A few months before he died, Parsons told Kaufman, if I die, I want somebody to have a few beers, take me out to the desert, and burn my body. The two made a pact that night. They would make sure the other would get buried in the desert. So Kaufman drove Parsons' corpse to Joshua Tree and set his casket on fire. This earned him a fine of $300. As there was no law against stealing a corpse, Kaufman and his friend were only fined for stealing the casket. On March 15, 1979, the Stephen Stills Band and Elvis Costello were staying at the same Holiday Inn in Columbus, Ohio, after both of them played shows that night. At the bar, Costello got drunk and started picking on the members of the Stephen Stills Band. Eventually, the band left the bar, all except for backup singer Bonnie Bramlett. As she taunted Costello, he showed an even uglier side. He yelled out racial slurs against James Brown and Ray Charles. Soon enough, the two got into a brawl. After Bramlett went to the press, Costello offered an excuse, but not an apology. He said, It became necessary for me to outrage these people with the most offensive and obnoxious remarks I could muster to bring the argument to a swift conclusion and rid myself of their presence. Costello also claimed to be drunk and tired from touring, but that's hardly an excuse for being racist. Jackie Fuchs was 15 years old in 1975 when she was spotted in LA and invited to music entrepreneur Kim Fowley's apartment. Fowley was in the process of creating an all-female band 
and he'd sent Rodney Binghamheimer to collect young, pretty women. This is how the Runaways were formed, but their manager was a man with an uncomfortable reputation. Fowley had a pattern of assault. That same year, he also assaulted an 18-year-old and a 14-year-old. Sadly, he would focus his attention on Fuchs at a 1975 New Year's Eve party, held in a motel following a quasi-successful runaway show. Fuchs was force-fed quaaludes and sexually assaulted by Fowley when she was too weak to fight him off. She recalled to the Huffington Post the moment she realized what was happening. I remember opening my eyes. Kim Fowley was raping me, and there were people watching me. My rape happened in front of so many witnesses, it's not a he said, she said. None of Fuchs' bandmates addressed the situation afterward, so Fuchs felt that if she spoke up, no one would back up her story. I was going to be the one that ended up on trial more than Kim. I carried the sense of shame and of thinking it was somehow my fault for decades. Sadly, the runaway story isn't a standalone atrocity in the 1970s music industry. This was the decade when R. Dean Taylor released his song, Shadow, with the lyrics, Body of a woman, mind of a child. Shadow, you sure do drive me wild. You're only 14 years old. Men having sex with underage groupies was so normalized at the time that no one batted an eyelid over lyrics such as Taylor's. Jimmy Page famously dated groupie Lori Maddox for a few years. Maddox was 14 years old when she met Page. He knew and tried to hide it. According to NPR, Page kept Maddox locked in his room at the Los Angeles Hyatt House Hotel, all too aware that he was committing statutory rape. And although the couple eventually became a common sight at Led Zeppelin's parties, Page was never held accountable for the relationship. Then there was Elvis Presley. Presley had a penchant for pursuing underage girls, and in 1959, he met 14-year-old Priscilla Presley. Following their divorce in 1973, Presley, now 38, went on to date another 14-year-old, Rika Smith. The 1970s music industry was full of criminals and other vicious characters. One of them was Paul Gadd, whose stage name was Gary Glitter. Gadd abused three young girls between 1975 and 1980. They will take you away one day, won't they? Oh, They'll come that. and go, this is it, Gary. Do you reckon? We're off. Unfortunately, this was not discovered until 2012, following a UK investigation initiative after the Jimmy Savile scandal. Detective Chief Inspector Michael Orchard commented on Gad's callousness, saying, Paul Gad has shown himself to be a habitual sexual predator who took advantage of the star status afforded to him by targeting young girls who trusted him and were in awe of his fame. His lack of remorse and defense that the victims were lying makes his crimes all the more indefensible. In 2015, Gad was convicted of one count of attempted rape, four counts of indecent assault, and one count of sexual intercourse with a girl under the age of 13. He was sentenced to 16 years in prison. If you or anyone you know has been a victim of sexual assault, help is available. Visit the Rape, Abuse, and Incest National Network website or contact Rain's National Helpline at 1-800-656-HOPE-4673. If you or anyone you know is struggling with addiction issues, help is available. Visit the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration website or contact SAMHSA's National Helpline at 1-800-662-HELP-4357.